Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us today. Uh, for now, I'm going to hand over to um, Abdullah from the Abidjan Convention to give us a recap of the past sessions. Thank you, uh, Tara. Merci, Tara. Merci, uh, mesdames et messieurs. Bonjour. Je suppose qu'on va Tara. être en ligne. I suppose that uh, we are online and uh, on Facebook. And uh, um, thank you to our uh, presenter today and uh, Tatiana and... Uh, Last week, we welcomed Mr. Ibrahim Yan, who made an insightful presentation on, let's say, um, mobile uh, mobilizations at local level. We learned quite a great deal of things. And in terms of community um, uh, mobilization, and now this is today the 18th session in a row. And um, may I recall that this series of webinars and uh, forms part of uh, the uh, program uh, funded by the European uh, Union and uh, UN Environment and it aims to provide various uh, countries with the regional framework to control plastic waste and to support those countries in terms of the preparation of the national action plan. And the third, I don't want to speak any further and over the floor to uh, Tara to, by way of introducing our speaker of the day. Thank you, Abdullah. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Tony Rubink, um, SST CEO to introduce Tatiana today. Thank you very much indeed. Um, this is, as Abdullah mentioned, the 18th presentation and all have been top quality. And once again, we have a fantastic speaker and we really are delighted, Tatiana, to have you join us. We're also very pleased to have the support and to be part of the Abidjan Convention in this. So we hope that we are able to make a difference in terms of the way in which countries move towards national and regional action plans. And in your talk then today, Tatiana is really important because there does need to be regional collaboration, but there also needs to be caution as to what does move across boundaries. So wonderful that you should be with us and thank you very much. To those of you who don't know Tatiana, and, and I have to confess this is the first time that I've been meeting her, uh, Tatiana Cherikova has played a leading role in partnership programs, engaged with non-state actors and illegal traffic and trade of hazardous chemicals. So, so after a very warm welcome to Tatiana and certainly a privilege for us to have you. Tatiana has played a leading role in the partnership program engaged in essentially illegal trade and hazardous chemicals across boundaries. And those, and that's been part of the Basel, Rotterdam, Stockholm conventions. T Tatiana, has implements a number of capacity building activities, and I should imagine she does that superbly, including the relation to marine pollution and plastic waste. So again, very, very relevant that she's with us today. She deals with sustainable development goals, and those of course are highly pertinent to the development of action plans. And in particular, it's indicators and governance issues of the Basel and Stockholm conventions Conventions Regional Centres. Prior to this function, she was coordinating capacity building activities for the implementation of the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions, including e-waste Africa, and that is going to be a really interesting facet of what we might learn from you. One wouldn't believe it, having met her, but she's been with the United Nations already for over 18 years, um, and this includes being with the Environmental Environmental Program, UNDP, USA UNEP, where she managed the Quick Start Program Trust Fund of the Strategic Approach to International Chemicals Management and the UN Institute for Training and Research, where she provided assistance to developing countries and countries in economic transition in various areas, um, particularly with regard to sound management of chemicals and waste. Uh, Tatiana is a national of the Russian Federation and she has a background in international environmental law and law degrees from Russia and Switzerland. So once again, Tatiana, 
we are so privileged to have you and thank you very much indeed for joining us today. We look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Tenny, for this, uh, for this introduction. And I, I would like also to, <clears throat> to say that I'm uh, very, very much uh, <clears throat> uh, pleased to participate in the today's webinar. Um, I'm, uh, I'm uh, based in the rainy Geneva and um, thank you very much. So, <clears throat> So today I will be uh, talking to you about the transboundary challenges uh, of, of plastic waste and regional action plans. And uh, as, as you heard from, from the introduction, I'm coming from the Secretariat of the three conventions, the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm conventions. And of course, the Basel is the main convention which deals with the hazardous and other waste. And I will be focusing on, on the Basel convention. Uh, for the time when I'm um, going through my slides, I'm going to stop video uh, just to make sure that the internet is, is smooth and stable. All right. So, um, so yes, in my in my talk, I will um, I will give you a quick overview of the Basel Convention and its main obligations with relation to transboundary movements or trade, I mean, for the purpose of waste, we, in the Basel Convention, we use the terminology transboundary movement rather than trade, as well as I will cover the recent uh, amendments to the Convention, specifically focusing on the plastic waste, as well as we'll talk about illegal traffic, um, then ongoing efforts uh, in terms of how, uh, how parties to the Basel Convention, but countries in general can be supported in this uh, challenging task, um, as well as uh, <clears throat> we'll finish by talking about the regional action plans. But I would like to start by um, sh sharing with you this um, <clears throat> With a, with a time with your timeline uh, which uh, looks at the various policy developments of the marine plastic uh, global policy and here we could see that back in 1960 uh, almost 60 well actually more than 60 years ago there was already some first uh, reports on the marine plastic debris uh, impacting the marine species. And then over the years, there have been quite a number of uh, various policy and uh, legally binding um, instruments adopted uh, at the international level, uh, such as MARPOL Convention, uh, then uh, the various uh, annexes to the Marple Convention, uh, London Protocol, and, and so on. So, as we can see, the 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 issue was really uh, focusing, uh, or the attention was really focusing on the issue of the marine uh, plastic debris at the national level. Um, then. Uh, 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 more recently, although it was already 30 years ago, the Basel Convention entered into force, as well as uh, some some other uh, conventions, such as uh, by, uh, Convention on Biodivers um, Biological Diversity, Stockholm Convention, and so on. And there, the focus uh, of, of this instrument is different. So, uh, <clears throat> and then the uh, the the, um, the attention or the, the developments uh, intensif intensified towards the, the last 10 years where the environmental uh, United Nations Environmental Assembly started also to look at the, into this issue of, um, of the marine litter uh, from the environmental point of view, as well as um, <clears throat> uh, mm, as well as SICOM, uh, uh, which is strategic approach to chemical management, also picked up on this issue. And, and finally, uh, in 2019, the Conference of the Party to the Basel Convention uh, adopted uh, the plastic waste amendment specifically on the, on the plastic waste. So, and I think it's quite interesting and this conversion of the issue starting as an issue of marine debris, um, then, towards uh, waste management in a way um, in a way the 
perhaps the tension, uh, this could be explained by the fact that um, the, the issue is so so big. It's it's about really production of plastic of plastic products. It's about consumption, increasing consumption of plastic plastic products, and uh, so the the efforts uh, which uh, are needed to combat this um, um, the consequences to the human health and uh, on the human health and environment um, uh, are really um, overwhelming. So so the broader action are needed um, and and what is also interesting is that when this issue of um, uh, came up at the Basel convention it was really about the marine litter it was about marine litter and uh, and uh, and plastic waste but but really linked to the to oceans to sea but very quickly um, uh, parties to the Basel Convention, uh, and especially those which are land-locked uh, countries, um, they, they also the voice concern that it's not only about issue of the seas and ocean, the plastic waste is polluting our rivers and uh, lakes, so, so very quickly this issue of the marine litter started um, to be viewed as an as a issue of plastic waste. And then the decisions which were taken at the Basel Convention, um, uh, Conference of the Parties to 2019, that was really about plastic waste, not only about marine litter. Um, yes, so um, just to just to say so what is the yes so what are the linkages between the, the plastic waste and Basel convention um, uh, I will I will explain that in the in a few moments uh, exactly uh, how the Basel convention addresses plastic waste uh, but before that I would like I, I want I would like to uh, go us through the the basics of the convention and also say a few words about um, uh, about the origin of the convention. So um, back in um, in nineties and eighties and nineties, um, in developed countries, uh, it was a wave of uh, awareness, uh, an environmental awareness awakening in a way. So the strict uh, legislation was adopted to protect the environment and the human health. And, and of course that led to the, to the fact that the cost of the disposal of hazardous waste and other ways uh, they in significantly increased. And, uh, and then it led to the situation where <clears throat> Uh, some companies or some in developed countries started to find a way, looking for a way to dispose the hazardous waste in a cheaper way by basically sending it, uh, this hazardous waste to developing countries. And there were several cases uh, which were quite, um, um, uh, which uh, made to the, to the media and uh, to newspapers, uh, for example, one uh, one uh, in Nigeria, so-called uh, cocoa case, when five ships transported uh, 8,000 barrels of hazardous waste from Italy to the small town of Coco in Nigeria, and the exchange of uh, $100 uh, monthly rent, uh, which was paid to Nigerian who uh, allowed the use of uh, his uh, farmland, which which led to the um, contamination of land. And so this type of cases really made a quite uh, uh, loud resonance in the, in the media, which which led to, to the negotiations of the Basel Convention. And what I wanted to mention here, I think, which are quite interesting about negotiations, is that um, when the convention was negotiated, um, there were there were two uh, opinions whether it should be ban of uh, transboundary movements uh, from developed to developing countries, or it should be control. And at that time, the African um, countries preferred ban. So whether it's uh, other countries, for example, Euro European Union preferred controlling, not, not total ban. And at that stage, it was um, a compromise uh, was made that um, <clears throat> the convention will be talking about controlling of transboundary movement, not banning. However, later, once convention will enter into force, uh, it will be amended. So to, to really to introduce this ban of transboundary movement. Um, 
and I will I will say that in, in, again in a couple of um, uh, minutes. So yeah, so from the from the to from the title of the convention, you can see that it's about control of transboundary movement. Um, and the, the objective is to protect the human health and environment, and the scope is hazardous and other waste. And um, what what do we mean by other? It's not uh, always that obvious, but uh, but the Basel Convention um, uh, specifically refers to other waste. It's a waste which are not necessarily hazardous, but they require special consideration because they are difficult to manage, to recycle, to dispose of. So the pre they pose some um, they pose a risk to health and environment. So um, and there are few. Um, <clears throat> type of waste. So currently uh, what is considered as others is uh, household waste, uh, ash uh, from the incineration of household waste and some type of plastic waste which I will um, I will explain uh, very soon. All right so and here we have the three pillars of the Basel Convention. So <clears throat> starting with the minimization. So it requires the parties minimizing uh, generation of hazardous waste in terms of the uh, quantity and degree of hazard. Then um, the convention uh, introduces um, this control procedure. This is uh, the third pillar. It's, uh, it requires the consent of a country of import and any uh, state of transit and a contract between exporter and, and uh, disposer uh, to ensure that the waste are not going to be dumped, but they'll be uh, managed in a environmentally sound manner um, before any uh, shipment can take place. So, uh, so you can see that the third, second and third pillar are very closely uh, linked. So the hazardous and other waste can be exported or imported, but only if they will be managed in an environmentally sound manner. Yes, and here uh, focusing on the, con this, this, uh, the pillar about control and transboundary movements. <clears throat> um, uh, as, as already mentioned, the, the movement can, can take place if there is a contract. Uh, which establishes conditions, um, then, then parties uh, can, uh, they have a right to decide whether they accept or not the import of waste and for which type of waste. And uh, <clears throat> the trade between party and non-party is not allowed. And uh, you, you, you saw it in the previous slide that Basel Convention has 188 parties, so it's already quite, uh, it's nearly universal, but there are still few parties, few countries in the world which are not parties. So, so as a rule, the trade with non-parties is not allowed unless uh, there is a bilateral or uh, a regional agreement which uh, provides the same level of protection uh, as the Basel Convention. And then this uh, so-called peak procedure, uh, which is the, let's say, the basis for the for this control procedure, it's a prior informed consent procedure, which I already briefly explained. So you need to have a consent um, before any shipment can take place. And uh, it's, there are, yeah, this, very specific procedures are in place. And uh, one of the important points, for example, here that there is a, the country of um, uh, export needs to issue a movement document which accompany the shipments throughout its way. And so that uh, country of export, uh, sorry, country of transit and import can, can see because uh, can know what kind of, um, it, it you know it can be informed about all these different details uh, about the shipment. So uh, there is information about who is receiving the shipment, uh, how the shipment will be, um, what is the let's say destiny of the shipment. For example, if it's sent for recycling, for disposal, and so on, uh, all the different coding. So very quite uh, comprehensive information is included in this movement document, and that is required in addition to the other. Uh, regular uh, standard documents when it uh, comes to the <clears throat> shipments of, of uh, different goods and waste. So, and, and so that the document is, is, is really very important for the, 
uh, yeah, to, to provide uh, useful information. Also, I need to mention that um, the, the parties, they have a right to restrict or to ban import, transit or, or export. And this is a prerogative. Um, and uh, uh, so this way they can protect, uh, um, yeah, they can, uh, they can, they might decide to protect uh, themselves from unwanted waste. And, and here, um, in a way, again, uh, just go a little bit de uh, more de in, into details about the speak procedure. So in principle, all waste um, categorize uh, into the waste which require the peak procedure and waste which do not require the peak procedure. So the ones which, which do require, these are the hazardous waste and the information about the specifics is included in annexes of the convention, uh, one, three and eight. Um, with the specific entry entries and specific information about <clears throat> uh, hazardous constituents and so on. And then this other waste, which I already mentioned, it's in Annex 2. So those two type of uh, categories of waste require peak procedure. So, and this way the um, competent authorities of the Basel Convention, which are often Ministry of Environment, they can control what goes in and out of the countries. So they can um, yeah, they can monitor, and yeah, and then the the third uh, uh, type of waste which do not require the peak procedure is a non-hazardous waste, and this type of waste uh, it it can be traded uh, without uh, this Basel control procedure. So um, yeah, and and then the competent authority are not so much involved in in, in this. So. So um, when this trade actually or transboundary movement to be precise can happen, it's actually can happen um, if under, under few conditions. Um, the first condition is either the country of uh, the state of export does not have technical capacity or necessary facilities or suitable disposal site uh, to dispose of the waste in question and in, in the environmentally sound manner. So this is one situation when transboundary movement sh can happen or another situation where the waste in question are required as a raw material for recycling or recovery industries in the state of import. So this is the second situation. So, uh, so the, you see the convention actually is quite um, preventive when uh, transboundary movement can happen at all. So it's really for un uh, under these two situations or conditions. Um, I should mention that uh, convention also provides that parties can uh, introduce additional requirements when it comes to transboundary movements. And we know, we know that some parties, for example, require that um, uh, countries, uh, sorry, the, the companies uh, which are dealing with import export, they, they have a um, license for, for import export, or for example, they have a license uh, or a permit for recycling operations for disposal. So, so par uh, parties also can uh, have additional requirements ac according to the national legislation. <clears throat> All right. Um, yes, and uh, I, I did mention that uh, in the beginning about the fact that African countries were very um, concerned about uh, the fact that the convention does not ban, but only controls. And uh, and that was a compromise uh, that uh, it, the convention will be amended later on. And in fact, that happened. So it was amended um, in 1995 um, with, the, with the provisions, which we call ban amendment, uh, which basically it's prohibition of OECD and EU member state and Liechtenstein to of transboundary movement of hazardous waste to other parties. <clears throat> uh, it took quite a while, as you can see, to, for the ban amendment to enter into force, um, but it is uh, now in, in enforced, uh, the ban amendment. And uh, it's um, <clears throat> It's ratified and therefore binding, uh, binding on 97 parties of the convention. All right, 
so now, so Ban Amendment is not the only amendment uh, which was introduced to the Basel Convention throughout these years. Um, as already mentioned uh, earlier, there were uh, another very important amendments which uh, were adopted in 2019 with regard to plastic waste. So, uh, and these amendments, they became effective uh, from the 1st of Janu January this year. So before that date, um, plastic waste was, was, tr uh, was mainly traded as non-hazardous waste, so it was not subject to the Basel Convention. However, given this um, tsunami of plastic waste uh, around the globe and in the environment and the, in the ocean and the sea, um, the government of Norway uh, made this proposal to clarify and to, uh, yeah, to to clarify the and make it and to amend the provisions. So it, it's it's very clear and uh, what what is under the scope of the Basel Convention and what is not, and but also to um, uh, to make sure that parties have the the instrument, the right to, to monitor the transboundary movement of plastic waste. So as you can see, as you can see here, um, now uh, all plastic waste are, have to categorize into the one of the three um, categories, whether it's a plastic waste under Annex 2, which is other waste, which are roughly speaking mixtures, uh, non-sorted, uh, non non-sorted, uh, non-clean mixtures. The it can be either uh, as in the second box. Uh, it can be traded as hazardous plastic waste, or as a third option, it can be traded as uh, clean plastic waste uh, destined for recycling. And for the first two entries, um, uh, the shipment uh, are subject to the peak procedure. And just to give you a little bit of details, so if in the situation when plastic waste is uh, imported, exported as hazardous, so here we have the, the definition. So this is a plastic waste, uh, including mixture, which is um, which contains or contaminated with the Annex 1 constituents, which, which is, for example, um, mercury, uh, uh, sorry, um, which is uh, it, it, it is hazardous com constituents to the extent that exhibits uh, Annex 3 characteristics, for example, ecotoxic, toxic, flammable, and so on. An example of uh, hazardous constituents uh, that could be found in plastic waste is um, the, the use of addit additives. Um, for example, um, organohalogen compound, uh, <clears throat> which are used as, as flame retardants or lead compound. Um, so that was hazardous waste, uh, plastic waste as hazardous. Now, if we look at the plastic waste as non-hazardous, and here now the convention is much more precise and clear than it was before. So in this uh, category, um, these are the plastic waste, which are destined for recycling in an environmentally sound manner and almost free from contamination. And here you have um, uh, the list of various um, types of plastic waste. So it's, it's mainly uh, single polymers. And here you can see the different list. So in, in most cases, it's single polymers. And uh, in one case, it could be mixture of the three specific polymers, which is PE, PP, and PET provided they are um, destined for the separate recycling of each material in an environmentally sound manner and almost free from contamination and, and other type of waste. So, so this is the, the amendment uh, when the plastic waste is uh, traded as non-hazardous and, and it does have some um, language uh, which could be subject for interpretation. For example, almost free from contamination. Um, and, and currently uh, parties are uh, looking into and uh, collecting um, uh, under various fora, uh, very, uh, collect, collecting information whether um, interpretation or some guidance could uh, do, do exist at the national level to, to help to um, also for the enforcement of this type of provisions. 
And then the, this third one, uh, which is uh, this mixture, what we have here is like a catch-on provision or catch-on uh, yeah, entry. So it's all plastic waste, including mixtures of plastic waste, except for wa plastic waste covered by um, Annex 8, as we just discussed, on, or Annex 9. So either hazardous or non-hazardous. So, so this, this is basically the plastic waste amendment, uh, which became effective from the January this year, and uh, yeah, and parties are expected to implement these amendments. So, in addition to the, to these amendments, um, there were a number of other important um, uh, requests for action uh, were made at the at this conference. The parties 2019, for example. Uh, one, I would like to mention that Secretariat uh, is developing the guidance uh, on inventory of plastic waste. Uh, this is uh, ongoing work. Another important uh, piece of work which is ongoing is the technical guidelines. Uh, we, we do have the technical guidelines on plastic waste, but they are from 2002 and now they are also being updated. And I will mention about partnership and uh, custom codes in, in, in few slides. So, yes, so now that the plastic waste amendment are in effective uh, and to be enforced, so what are the expected impact? It's, I know this is still early days, but the, um, the expectation is that uh, this plastic waste amendment will promote recycling, um, that to ensure that whatever, when, whenever plastic waste are being traded, they're already in a form which is easily recycling, that they're sorted and clean and so on. So that they will not be dumped. Um, and, and so this is another impact is prevent dumping. Um, we also think that um, the amendments will help with um, um, adequate disposal facilities um, to the extent possible, of course, within the country. And um, overall, uh, uh, the amendment in, in the long term would be promoting the sustainable consumption production and um, uh, minimization of generation of plastic waste uh, because it's possible to do it through the design, uh, reduction of uh, use of uh, hazardous additive and, and so on and so forth. So here, I just want to very quickly show you the, the trade uh, between um, various countries um, of plastics. Uh, and here, uh, here the, as you know, when, when we're talking about trade, um, it, it's, it's closely associated with the um, uh, custom codes. And, and here, the custom codes, which is used is, um, uh, it, it's a, a custom code um, uh, related to plastic waste, and and here I just wanted to show you that in terms of the exporters, you have sub uh, top five countries. They are the top exporters in 2019 at least, and then some are fast. Uh, some um, exporters uh, also becoming. Yeah, more active and then there is also like for example China is de declining export as, as we can say and and if we look at the importers here also um, uh, for example Germany Turkey Malaysia China ne Netherlands so they are still top importers uh, and this is in terms of volumes not the, in terms of value volumes and and we also can see some growing uh, exporting countries as well as the fastest declining countries. And uh, we don't see much uh, trade from the previous graph here, uh, the one I showed, but I wanted to share with you some analysis we have made for, um, for Ghana as part of our project um, on, uh, on plastic waste. And here you can see that there is an increase uh, of import of plastic waste according to the customs data uh, with a sharp rise starting in 2017. Um, so if you look at this period uh, from 2013, the increase over six years is actually quite, uh, it's quite big, a tenfold increase. So although we don't see um, the, 
the tsunami of imports or for example illegal imports like it has been happening uh, for example with electronic waste uh, into africa um, so we don't see, we don't see it the, the same tr similar trend but there is a some there is an increase of import of plastic waste um, for example in this case in, in ghana we did it only for ghana and here I just uh, wanted to show you the current uh, HS codes, uh, which have been used for customs, right? Uh, this is 3915. Um, it's important to say that um, uh, at the moment there is no dedicated HS code which correlate to the uh, differentiation of plastic waste under the Basel Convention in line with the new amendments. So the H, 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 current HS codes do not distinguish between non-hazardous from hazardous or mixed plastic waste. Um, so, um, um, so here, yeah, here um, we are as a secretariat of the Basel Convention um, working with the WCO, the World Custom Organization, to. <clears throat> Uh, uh, to see how the HS codes for plastic waste could be amended. So, uh, and uh, based on the request from our parties, we, we, we prepared a draft proposal, uh, which will be submitted to WCO this year um, to allow for the identification of plastic waste according to the plastic waste amendments. And here I just wanted to, yeah, to share with you that indeed um, HS codes are a very important tool for custom authorities and, um, and in some situation um, there is uh, something which we call the tariff slip, which is then when uh, some companies, ex uh, import expert companies, they are using different HS codes to declare plastic waste, uh, sorry, plastic, but not, not as waste, but it can be declared as uh, plastics or used big bags. So, and these are the one, these are the examples of the information which custom authorities need to consider, take into consideration when they uh, developing uh, the strategy, enforcement strategies, for example, how to identify shipments which could contain uh, plastic waste, although maybe there is a misdeclaration and, uh, and, and custom do use this type of consideration when they de develop some risk profiles and risk indicators uh, uh, for their work. Um, another issue I just wanted to very quickly mention is that, um, again, it's not really uh, on the plastic waste specifically, but it's on the um, all hazardous and other waste. And this is something which uh, receive quite, uh, is receiving quite a lot of uh, attention from, from at least some of the parties. And, um, and this is the work on electronic approaches for the notification of movement documents. And just to mention that there is um, the work ongoing uh, to uh, to look at other parties experience other uh, conventions uh, whether what are the electronic system for exchanging for exchanging information and controlling movement of uh, goods and, and waste so we had um, we have done some reports uh, some uh, consult consultation workshop or meeting so um, if you are interested, we will be, you know, we, we, you can always in, approach us and we can share more information on that. Um, but this is still work in progress. And um, as you can imagine, it's for the global instruments like a Basel Convention, it's, it's, uh, it probably will take uh, some time for to see some, um, some results. But, but this is, uh, let's say, this is a tool which could potentially could help with the transboundary movements in terms of the the fact that sometimes it takes long time for the various uh, authorities to provide their consent, consent to reply and, and so on. So this is really try to speed up uh, the process, uh, the procedure and um, yeah, digitalize procedure so-called. All right. Um, yes. So, so what happened is if all these procedures, which I was talking about, uh, they're not, uh, uh, respected. So if they're not respected, then um, Basel Convention provides, uh, has, a, has a concept of illegal traffic. Um, 
which is uh, to be considered as a criminal under the national legislation. And that is uh, quite um, a strong tool uh, for the environmental sound, uh, sorry, for the environmental um, agreement, because uh, normally under international environmental law, um, par countries are, uh, the, the tools which are available is to encourage and to provide assistance, technical assistance, project and so on. So here the, the convention does include something very precise and specific where um, uh, enforcement, uh, law enforcement authority uh, could, could actually take action and measures to enforce the convention. And here you have uh, definition of illegal traffic. So it's, it's what it is. It's basically transboundary movement uh, without notification, without consent. Uh, if consent is obtained uh, through falsification of fraud, if it does not conform with document, and for example, if you have a shipment and what is inside this, the container is different from what is on the on the on the paper, basically on the in the movement document or notification. So, or if it's a deliberate disposal, so that is the intent behind. So these are the different situation when transboundary movement will be considered as illegal traffic. And, and here I just wanted to show with you, uh, to share with you some data we have from parties about the cases of illegal traffic. It's not on plastic waste, it's on all um, type of different waste. And, uh, but I think it's already uh, quite representative to show that, for example, if you look at the regions, uh, if you look at Africa, here the significant, more, uh, significant number of cases are import illegal import and very, very little is illegal export. Whether there is, for example, a VOC, which is a um, Western Europe and other uh, developed countries, the significant amount, uh, number of cases is, is, if, is illegal export. And if you look at the, how those cases have been resolved, on the left side, we have um, uh, this different, um, um, ways how they resolved throughout the, or around the world from all different regions and on the right side it's in, um, in developed countries and you can see that um, for example if you look at the right side a quite big proportion it was that the waste in question were disposed of uh, in another country or in a specialized facility S uh, then some of them they returned to country of export or didn't even leave the country of export so they were caught at the port. Uh, another option that the, this waste were accepted after the investigation was the country of import. And then in some cases it was a fine um, and even imprison, uh, imprison them and, um, uh, yeah, and some civil remedies. So you can see that, uh, yeah, the, there are various uh, ways how parties are dealing with the cases of uh, confirmed cases of illegal traffic. Um, but as, as we know that this is an environmental agreement, so the, the, primarily, the primary purpose is, is really to restore the environment and not to harm the environment. So, um, so, so um, this the, the sanctions have to take this into account. So the, the idea is not only to punish the um, uh, offenders, but, but also to make sure that the waste in question will not be just dumped somewhere, but they will be managed in a warm design manner. All right, um, sorry, I'm getting a bit <laughs> long. Just very quickly, so what, how, so, so what are the different um, action or measures or uh, can, which can, can be undertaken by countries uh, to deal with all these different challenges. So there are many, of course, many different measures, but one, one is technical assistance and partnerships. And at least I would like to give you example under the Basel Convention. Here we have, um, um, for example, we have a network uh, on enforcement uh, on illegal traffic. So it's called enforced, Enforce. And this is a network uh, which includes par some parties uh, which represent regions as regional centers. For example, for Africa, it's a regional center for the Basel Convention in South Africa. And, and as well as organizations such as um, Interpol, Europol, uh, World Custom Organization, UNAP, uh, and, 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 and others. 
and uh, and there you have a raising raising uh, awareness raising webinars some coordination of activities and 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 so on another example where the action can be taken is also another partnership uh, which is a plastic waste partnership which has over sorry there is a little mistake it's it's not over 10 it's actually over 100 member entities representing parties um, international organizations ngos and uh, the mandate of this partnership is quite large and also the activities which could be done you could see that the partnership is collecting information identifying barriers collecting best practice and so on and here since we're talking about transboundary movements i just wanted to uh, bring your attention to the project group and on transboundary movement, which, for example, uh, currently looking at um, collecting best practices on the enforcement of the uh, Basel Convention in relation to plastic waste. As also as well as a partnership um, uh, has recently approved 23 pilot projects, um, and possibly it will be uh, more in the future. And uh, on, on another note, so we also have another project funded by NORAD in uh, Ghana and Sri, and Sri Lanka. And uh, here, again, um, I think there is a work which is relevant to our discussion today. It's a work on the plastic waste inventories, on the legal institutional framework, and um, uh, training education and uh, training of custom authorities and other law enforcement authorities and, and so on. And uh, there also, also there will be shortly ASM strategy, which is an environmental sound management strategy, which look at the, all these different elements from prevention minimization to final disposal. We also do similar work in uh, Malawi and Zimbabwe for, with a different uh, donor, Norwegian Retail Environment Fund. And, and, and finally, there are um, a few more projects um, being implemented or starting to be implemented. And here I just highlighted those in Africa. Uh, and I think, yes, as most of them, they're about uh, uh, management. Um, but uh, for example, the one in Nigeria, it's on the management and transboundary movement. And the one in uh, Lesotho, Malawi, Namibia, Tanzania, and, and Zambia, it will be also, it will have the element of transboundary movement. So uh, if you're interested, I will be happy to put you to uh, put you in touch with the uh, regional centers with, which are responsible for the implementation of these projects. And then just the last word uh, from my side, and I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting, uh, yeah, I'm getting to the end. So it's it's about really the, the action, regional action plans and the elements to consider. And there, I, th I think um, all in all, um, all, all, on all in all, Basel Convention does uh, requires um, to take actions which um, are very important and could be considered for the regional action plan. But just to say a few words here, first of all, Generate, knowing how much, knowing, having data and knowing how much has been generated and imported and exported in, in the country on the national level and, and, and also the regional level is very important. Then understanding the capacity, again, at the national level, but also regionally, like where the, uh, let's say, disposal facilities in the region or in the sub-region are located and how big are the facilities and um, what kind of waste, uh, plastic waste they can recycle and, and so on. So that information is, uh, is let's say it's a baseline, it's, it's necessary to, to consider what should go into the regional action plan. Then of course, financial schemes as well, um, which country do have, which don't, and if not, they, they have to be considered. Then adequate legal framework which enact the requirement of the Basel Convention at the national level to ensure a level playing field. And this is, again, extremely important. And we have seen that also with e-waste. So if uh, some countries uh, become start to take stricter action with regard to the, for example, enforcement based on the national legislation, then uh, there could be some activities moved to a different country which doesn't ha which don't have uh, uh, appropriate legislation and enforcement. So, um, yeah. So from that point of view, the regional approach is also very important. 
um, there is also um, consideration could be taken um, whether you know countries want to take advantage of this right of this right under the Basel Convention to restrict or to ban certain type of uh, plastic waste if there is no capacity to manage such waste in an envir environmentally sound manner. Um, yeah, so then enforcement at the national regional level already mentioned that. So if, um, and we, we, we could really see, especially when it comes to the shipments and um, the, um, the, the exporters, importers, which are not, uh, uh, you know, which um, trying to avoid some requirements, they can be very resourceful and uh, they can easily move the trading routes from one country to another. So, so uh, consider that at the regional level, it's, it's, it's very important. And, oops, sorry. Yeah, and then uh, careful consideration also should be, uh, should be given to issues. Okay, so is it uh, other, do, are you planning to encourage or to promote, uh, to support your recycling industry? What do you need for that? Is, is there a need for the um, uh, plastic waste uh, from outside for this industry? Or you want to promote um, uh, collection and recycling of domestically generated plastic waste? So also, um, yeah. Uh, promoting the recycling industry should not be at the expense of the human health and environment. So things like that, uh, this, these are all the Im important elements to consider. And, and here, yes, I'm not going to go through all of that, but you'll have my presentation. This is a very interesting exercise we have done to look at these different interlinkages. Um, and, uh, and you can really see that it's, it's all, um, uh, yeah, if you look, for example, at import and export, uh, if you look at the cost effectiveness of complying with the environmental regulation elsewhere, it can lead to the illegal import. And then when you have an import, you have to see what to do with that, whether you sort, you, do, you send it for storage, um, for sorting, if it's for sorting, it goes to incineration, treatment, recycling, and then some of the recycling goes to the production of plastic waste, some of them, uh, yeah, so, and, and here you can see it was a, it was a orange uh, mark, uh, orange uh, highlights. These are basically the policy, uh, let's say, interventions. So, and, uh, and I think these are the, maybe interesting to, to look at that, all these different dependencies of different issues when you develop your regional action plans. So I will stop here and um, sorry that I, I, I think I went a little bit <laughs> over time. And um, I'm, I will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Tatiana. That was, that was wonderful. No worries about the time. It was very interesting. Uh, we've had a few questions come through in the Q&A box so long. Um, if anyone else has any questions, please, please feel free to send those through. Uh, the first one says, in the recent scandal pertaining to an Italian company exposing hazardous municipal waste to Tunisia, uh, how does the convention help or put pressure on Italy and the EU to repatriate their waste? Mm -hmm. Yes, no, that's a very, very good question and a very important question. Indeed, uh, there was a um, recent case uh, involving those two countries and so we as a secretariat have a very strict, quite, quite restricted, quite limited, but a very um, precise mandate on what can be done in this situation. So what we usually are, uh, let's say, allowed or requested to do is to facilitate communication between two countries and to provide um, some clarification or uh, some explanation uh, with regard to the articles of the convention. Um, however, um, uh, but this is this is about it in terms of this what secretariat can do as um, because we are there to to serve parties. So we cannot really take any sides, and uh, we have been yeah we we, we are aware of, of this case. So. Um, so you see, and this is when it comes, uh, what, is, what is really important um, to really understand, 
first of all, if, if this case is a confirmed case of the illegal traffic. So, and for that, uh, the waste in question, in question should be waste um, addressed by the Basel Convention. Meaning, for example, if it's a non-hazardous uh, plastic waste, that would be outside of the Basel Convention. If it's a, a mixed um, plastic waste, which is subject to the Annex 2, which is um, this mixture and unsorted and so on, that would be subject to the Basel Convention and that in potentially that uh, type of waste can be subject to illegal traffic. So, and this is when, um, you know, then all the enforcement agencies uh, need to step up and uh, collect evidence. And so this is where the, the legal case can be brought uh, uh, to court and prosecution and so on. So I cannot really go into details about the specific cases um, and including this one, uh, but just to say that, um, yeah, yeah in, in that case, um, yeah, what, what convention really says is uh, convention does not uh, give very um, detailed, I mean, doesn't have very detailed provisions. What happens after the case has been confirmed? Uh, there are some provisions whether that country of, for example, if it's the responsibility of the country of export, the country of export must take it back and uh, dispose, or for example, if it's impossible to determine whether it's uh, whose fault is that, or whose res responsibility is that, if, of, if it's a country of import or country of export, then uh, what the convention says that uh, those two countries have to um, discuss, and uh, it's, it's about international cooperation. They have to uh, agree uh, what to do, where this uh, waste will be disposed of. So, yeah, so when it comes to situations like that, it's really two countries need to, uh, which are concerned, which need to agree um, on the on the solution. <clears throat> yeah, this is um, this is about that case. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, there's another question that says third world countries are not sufficiently equipped to check in case uh, of use of fraudulent HS codes um, by exporting countries. Is there any global body or authorities to double check the quality of the plastic waste under such a case? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, again, uh, again, very, very good question about HS codes. Um, so, well, first of all, I, um, so the first, uh, it's not a problem, but this is the current situation and this is where we are. So first of all, the current HS codes are not uh, exactly in line uh, with the plastic waste amendment. So it's, for the customs, it's quite difficult to know whether the shipment uh, in question is a subject to the peak procedure or not. Um, Plus, uh, also the exporters can use the wrong codes purposely, right, to get away from the peak procedure. So uh, what is being done? Um, no, there is no really global body authority to double check the, um, in each cases because, you know, in the big ports, uh, for example, in Europe, you have hundreds and hundreds of containers which are being shipped every day through the ports, big ports, and um, and it's physically it's impossible to check each and sing, each uh, single one of them, but this is what uh, what countries do. First of all, of course, there is um, uh, inspectors, and then they inspect. But again, they cannot inspect hundreds of containers every day. But this is where the the customs work and inspectors uh, they have some strategies. They have enforcement strategies, so they they have a um, profiling of of potential. Um, uh, offenders, for example, a company which, depending on the country of destination, country of, uh, for example, country in ex import, country of transit, also dependent on the type of uh, HS code. So some of the codes are known to be this uh, tariff slippage, as I mentioned. So if um, they notice, oh, that this can, this shipment has uh, indicated uh, that they are using these codes, so maybe. So this could come up as a container, suspicious container to be checked. So um, what I can say that at the European level, uh, there is an organization called IMPEL. So it's an organization um, 
uh, which are comprised of uh, well, competent authorities, but also inspectors and, and customs and um, on the European level. And they are doing a lot of work to really um, to, to, to fight, to combat illegal traffic in, for these particular reasons. So, because the easiest is actually prevent illegal traffic. It's prevent containers from leaving the country of export because then to take it back, it, 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 it involves a lot of costs. So, so what we know, for example, UK has been uh, uh, quite um, uh, active in, um, in, in activities to not uh, to, to basically try to stop the containers to even reach the port. So they do a lot of intel intelligence work, um, to preventive work. So because when the uh, containers, uh, suspicious containers are already in the port, it's already quite difficult to catch them, especially given the volume. So yeah, this is one thing. But also at the, you see at the level of the country of import, uh, customs also can take action. And they also have this enforcement strategies to again have the risk indicators some risk profiling and and what is really important is to have a communication between the competent authorities of uh, for example africa and europe and this is what we have been yeah uh, saying for in case of e-waste but in case of uh, plastic waste this is also very relevant so uh, to have such a network so currently we don't uh, there is no such there is no such a network there is on the level of the european union um, then we have this network of enforce, but that is not so, I mean, it's not really, it does not really look into the daily operations. So, but, uh, but I think in general, uh, it, it is encouraged to have a uh, regional networks, which would help um, countries to, to, yeah, to take measures to prevent cases of illegal traffic. Um, Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, there's there's another question that says, uh, do we have any digital tool to enforce EPR globally, extended producer responsibility? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I don't think there is a tool like that. Um, in fact, uh, quite interestingly, I uh, uh, and and again, EPR um, it depends also on, on what type of waste, because for example, for for electronic waste, uh, some countries uh, has already introduced EPR. Um, it, EPR also could be used for packaging uh, waste and so on. So no, globally there is no digital tool, um, but I did, for example, um, heard some ideas to do it on the global level. Maybe one organization can um, can take it up. But for now, I think this uh, there is nothing more than just any, any talks about that. Um, if you're interested in PR, you probably know that OECD has uh, quite um, uh, comprehensive uh, guidelines on EPR. Um, but uh, yeah, but but for now there is there is no digital tool uh, to enforce EPR on the global level. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, there's a comment and a question from Abdullah that says one of the objectives of the Abidjan Convention under the ACP MEA's number three program is to assist member countries in meeting their obligations under the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm conventions. Uh, and these webinars are part of that. What do you think are the main difficulties that countries face in implementing the obligations of the BRS conventions and which aspects deserve the most attention? Yeah. Um, well, if again, if if we focus on the plastic waste now, um, I think the most uh, immediate difficulties to implement the implementation of the plastic waste amendment, which of course it it goes broad. It's really implementation implementation of the Basel Convention, and here you have various. Um, there is a number of difficulties, so. The first difficulty, the most immediate one, that is to ensure that the legislation is um, national legislation is amended to implement the plastic waste amendment appropriately. So that is uh, the most immediate um, uh, step or concern, I would say, uh, to consider. Then the second one is, um, as we discussed now, the 
enforcement is a big issue. And from that point of view, for the custom officers already now should be um, should be aware of um, how to proceed. Um, but you see, given the HS codes are not exactly in line with the uh, amendments, relying on HS codes, it's currently is not possible. Although you, you can take some steps uh, at the national level uh, to, um, you can actually adopt HS codes uh, and can have your national HS codes by adding some numbers. So, and that will help customs. But for example, uh, training of customs to classify, uh, to, to identify plastic waste, that is, but also to know, to know the procedures of the Basel Convention. This is another, I think, big challenge. Um, uh, then, yeah, then uh, the whole, uh, the whole issue of the uh, management and by management, we actually on the Basel, we, uh, we um, consider all the different operations or all the different stages, starting from the collection of, of plastic waste towards uh, sorting and um, uh, recycling, resource recovery, disposal. So all of these different stages of, uh, so that is collection is still a problem in many countries. There is no uh, financial schemes um, to support recycling companies, uh, yeah, recycling facilities. So there, there are quite, um, yeah, there are quite few challenges I would say. So um, to say which are the most, um, the most important one. Um, yeah, it, it, it really, I would say I would say enforcement is is one important challenge. Uh, then, environmentally sound management and also to it's it's the second one. Um, then also there is the whole issue of the minimization, right? And uh, consider alternative um, alternative products. For example, in Ghana, um, we have been. Uh, in, in our project, we have been also looking into the fishing nets, and I think maybe yeah, for other African countries, it, it could be similar challenge that um, <clears throat> fishing, the so-called ghost fishing nets are a, a, a big uh, big issue, although they're not necessarily hazardous, but you know, how to find it, how, how to come up with a scheme that they're not just being uh, dumped in the sea, but they're being collected properly. So then they can be recycled. So there are quite a few challenges uh, <laughs> uh, uh, with, with regard to the plastic waste. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, there's another question here from Daniel that says, uh, what is the right procedure to export or import plastic waste for the purposes of recycling in any country in accordance with the Basel Convention protocol? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here it depends if your plastic, if, if the plastic waste is hazardous, non-hazardous, meaning the single polymers or the mixture of PE, PP or PTE, or it's another mixture. So if it's um, uh, non-hazardous, this single uh, polymers or this uh, very specific mixture, and it's sent for recycling, then uh, the Basel Convention does not apply. In that case, it doesn't apply, then the competent authorities are not involved, then it's a uh, trade procedures or trade uh, transaction as for, for goods. If it's uh, if the if the plastic waste what we're talking about is hazardous or this mixture mixed plastic waste, then the con the the Basel Convention does apply, and in that case uh, the starting point is that for the company which wants to export it, they need to contact their con their competent authority in their country. So usually it's Ministry of Environment. Uh, we we have the list of. Um, of contact points on our website. So, and then they have to inform them. And if uh, the Minister of Environment Competent Authority agrees uh, that, okay, this, and they checked, they check, um, oh, but sorry, but before, before that, uh, this company needs to show that there is a contract between this company and the company, for example, in the country B. 
uh, that, uh, that the country will uh, be managing this uh, plastic waste and environmental design manner. So, and, um, and if, if your competent authority agrees with that, then it will contact the country of transit and uh, import uh, for the consent. And if the consent will come back positive, then the competent authority will issue movement document and will give you the green light to start the, to start the shipment. And um, yeah, so normally you need to receive, um, you know, you will receive, an, um, a, let's say, authorization to proceed with the shipment. You have to do it for every single shipment. But if, the, if you have a series of shipment of similar waste, then uh, it can be uh, done for the, the for the whole series and it will be valid for one year. So this is a, in a rough terms, um, this is the procedure, the right procedure, really dependent, first of all, on the what kind of type of plastic waste we're talking about. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, I have a question um, regarding the prior informed consent stages that you mentioned earlier on in your presentation. Uh, I believe the third one uh, referred to insurance of movement. Uh, does that insurance apply if there's a problem with the transport of the shipment and waste ends up in the environment? For example, if there's a problem uh, transporting via sea and plastic ends up going into the ocean, does that insurance cover any of the removal? Yeah, indeed. Um, uh, the convention refers to the um, um, to the financial guarantees, bonds, and or insurances for the transboundary movement, um, but that is um, based on the national legislation, and 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 many countries do have such a requirement for transboundary movement. So, and indeed, this uh, the insurance or financial guarantee uh, they they serve to cover cost if the movement can no, cannot take place as planned so <clears throat> so so that is really to yeah to cover the cost when it comes to the illegal traffic um, since um, often the often there is no insurance or there is no financial guarantee because um, because waste are being exported or imported as non hazardous is not subject to the basel convention so um, or yeah, there is a falsification, so on. So then there is no requirement to apply this uh, financial guarantee. And then what happens is that there is no um, any possibility to, to cover the cost of, uh, of, of this illegal traffic. So, um, but for the legal, uh, for the legal transboundary movement, indeed, if the country, if any of the country which involve in the movement requires that, then, you, you know, then the, companies need to ensure that they follow these requirement, requirements. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, I don't see uh, any other questions in the chat um, or in the Q&A box. So if anyone has any further questions, please do send those through. Uh, if not, we can um, forward those questions on to Tatiana after the presentation, um, if you send those on at a later stage. Um, but otherwise, uh, thank you so much, Tatiana. It was a very interesting presentation. Um, and I just have one other question. Um, you referred to um, the inventory list that was being developed um, as part of the new pilot studies. Um, using that, would you be able to track um, sort of global recycling rates or volumes based on where the plastic waste is sort of being exported, imported, and tracking who's then <laughs> exporting recycled material? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a uh, yeah, very, very good question. Um, so, so there are a couple of things here. So first of all, um, uh, we are developing the, the guidance for the inventory of, um, of plastic waste on the national level. And uh, parties will be encouraged to use them, use this inventory, but, the, the, but there is no obligation to that. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there is an obligation to provide information to the national report every year. And <clears throat> And this report provides. Uh, it, it, this report contains various different questions and information, but one important part of that is about um, data on uh, import export of waste. So, and you also have a specification whether this waste is for recycling or disposal. So, for now, we have only the data for 2019. Um, so, I think. Uh, 
to have uh, so so there will be data on plastic waste is what i'm trying to say uh, but only a few a uh, few years down the road um, because there is a little bit of delay uh, when the parties are uh, have the obligation to submit the data so and since um, plastic uh, yeah, plastic waste amendment became effective only this year, so meaning that countries will start uh, registering the, um, uh, yeah, start monitoring the transboundary movement of plastic waste only starting this year. So we'll probably be, we'll start receiving information and only in 2023 about plastic waste. Um, but this is obligation. But in terms of the uh, national inventories, uh, this is something which uh, for example, we are working through with uh, in our technical assistance project. We are working with various countries, and many of them they do. Uh, we will be uh, developing the um, the inventories, which will look at the generation of uh, hazardous sorry of plastic waste as well as the import export. So that information will be available, um, you know, once the projects are completed. Um, I know that there are also a few other um, organizations, and uh, we have we have been. Uh, uh, yeah, in, in contact with quite a few organizations, uh, including UNAP, but also the World Economic Forum and uh, IUCN and a few others, which are also looking at the issue of uh, inventory <clears throat> and uh, data collection on, on plastic. And with a different focus, right, because our focus is not necessarily leakages to the sea, uh, but more, uh, yeah, understanding the plastic waste generated in the country on the national level, uh, whether it's, there are some, some methodologies which look at the, um, yeah, exactly the leakages to the sea and, and uh, what is the impact on, on the sea. But, but there are a few, few methodologies, I think, uh, right now, you know, either being developed or have been developed. So it, it looks like there is a lot of movement on this, on this side, uh, trying to understand the whole scope of, um, of, of plastic waste in the world because uh, yeah it's this data is quite difficult to to come by I, I find and yeah given that the trade data we have is not maybe at the moment very precise. Thank you Tatiana I, I completely understand I think gathering that kind of data and doing all that research it definitely takes time um, <laughs> to sort of to research those um, to almost do that networking and and get the the relevant data and all the figures that go along with it um i see there is a comment in the chat that says we are developing a digital platform for recycling and we are considering epr transfer mm -hmm. um, so that's that's good Very to hear. interesting yeah I don't see any other questions uh, in the chat or the Q&A box, um, but again, if anyone has any questions at a later stage or while watching the recording, uh, please feel free to email us um, or, or to email Tatiana directly um, and we'll happily pass those along um, if they come through to us. Um, otherwise, I think we can close here for today. Um, so sincerely, thank you so much, Tatiana. It was a very interesting presentation, and I think it's given us all <laughs> a lot of a lot to think about and um, and to keep an eye out for with the new projects that are being launched. Um, I think I'm sure Tony or Abdullah will also um, jump in to share their thanks before we close off. Um, thank you, thank you. Um... Tatiana, euh, c'était une très belle présentation. Euh, et encore une fois, j'en profite pour euh, um, rappeler que. Uh, right, you recall ce... that. Um, I received English, okay. Donc, it was a, a great pleasure for us to have Tatiana with us today. We have been discussing extensively for the past two years. My memory of me right. And as I've said um, in the question, we will have to need the input of the IRS training and to help us develop this framework at regional level and to help country to honor their obligation as part of the convention that we signed internationally. So we are pleased to have you uh, with us and thank you for the forthcoming document that will be uh, generated at the end of the webinar uh, headed by the Abidjan uh, Convention and uh, and with uh, the African project 
and we thank uh, such partners like you, <laughs> like also BRSM. Thank you. Tatiana from Sustainable Seas Trust, we'd like to thank you very much indeed too. Um, as mentioned by both the others, really very informative. I certainly learned a lot and I think it was a very valuable input into the series that we're having on the, this, this webinars to develop action plans, something that we really do need to include. So thank you very much indeed. And also thanks to all of those who participated and to the Abidjan Convention for hosting this series of talks. So Tatiana, fantastic. Thank you. Have a good day. I just wanted to say that, yes, it was indeed a pleasure and thank you very much for inviting us. And um, I think uh, it would be also very interesting to see how we could uh, cooperate further with the Abidjan Convention, um, because uh, obviously there are a lot of areas, I think, uh, we could uh, support each other and, and also whether, uh, let's say, on the policy area, but but also for the in the capacity building activities, as you can see, we have a quite few countries uh, we're working with. So I think this is also opportunity to uh, consider maybe further collaboration. So yeah, so we're we're very happy to be part of this um, of this webinar series and also of this conversation with the Abidjan Convention. Thank you, Tatiana. I'm sure there's plenty of room to collaborate um, going further. Uh, Thank you again so much um, on behalf of SST and the, and the Abidjan Convention. Um, it was a wonderful presentation this afternoon and we really value your input in the series.